and the world knows these events and uh, consider that could be very dangerous for aeronautical situation, especially in my country. I don't know why in my country that's occurred frequently, but the, the point is that happens, and, uh, and we consider dangerous, and we had only, uh, unfortunately, one trash, but we don't want to have an, another more. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for my English. My name is Graham Bethune. I'm a retired Navy commander, pilot, had a top secret clearance. Fifty years ago, February the 10th, 1951, I was flying from Keflavik, Iceland to Argentia, Newfoundland. It was at night, it was dark. About 300 miles outside of Argentia, I saw a glow on the water, like approaching a city at night. As we approached this glow, it turned to a monstrous circle of white lights on the water. We watched this for a while, the lights went out, there was nothing on the water. Next thing we saw was a yellow halo, small, much smaller than whatever it was launched from, and that was 15 miles away, whew, up to our altitude. Because of the trajectory, I disengaged the autopilot, shoved the nose over to try to go under this thing. And at that time, I heard a noise underneath, I thought maybe it hit us, it was actually some of the crew members ducking and they collided and a couple of them were injured. Then it appeared over to the right and moved out slowly and flew with us. It was still not at our altitude, but we could see the shape of it. It had a dome. We could see the, we could see the coronal discharge. I went back aft, let the other pilot, Al Jones, take my seat to see what the passenger's reaction was. Came back to the cockpit, told him not to report anything, simply because what that the psychiatrist had said to me, maybe they would lock us up. So basically, the instruments in the cockpit, we had four or five failures in the area of magnetic compass, you know, the electromagnetic effect, in the area of directional finders, and this type of thing. The craft was tracked by radar in excess of 1,800 miles an hour. It never did get to our altitude. We had 31 passengers, plus the psychiatrist and the crew members that all sighted this at, at different areas. When we landed at Argentia, Newfoundland, we were t interrogated by the Air Force, an excellent interrogation, Captain Paulson. When we landed at the Naval Air Test Center here at Patuxent River, we were required by Navy intelligence to make out individual reports. Out of the National Archives, I have the, the 18 page official Navy and Air Force report. I've made up a, a report to straighten out all the truth. There's a stack of books out there this high that have written all of this up. So the truth is here. I will testify under oath before Congress that everything that I have said is true. My name is Dan Willis. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communications Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean uh, near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object, approximately 70 feet in diameter, emerged out of the water, <coughs> shot into space, uh, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Uh, years later, I worked at the um, Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. The um, co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens that track everything out in space and in the air. Objects going off the scale, doing right angle turns. When he inquired, um, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. I thought this was a little unusual. 
Uh, these statements are true. I'm willing to testify under oath before Congress. Thank you. My name is Don Phillips. I was in the United States Air Force and uh, had worked with certain intelligence agencies of the United States government. Prior to my Air Force, uh, uh, prior to joining the Air Force, I worked for the famous Lockheed Skunk Works. And I was working for them when I was attending college and I worked, them in, I worked for them in the capacity as a design engineer. It was one of my proudest moments of my life to work with a man by the name of Kelly Johnson. A lot of you might be familiar with that. Uh, it turns out that the models of aircraft that we were building, as you know, uh, were all classified, were in the deep black, and that I came in on, on the end of the U-2 project. My main project was known later as the SR-71. The SR-71 had a predecessor. It had a special model built for the CIA and that those models were one, one passenger, one pilot, special aircraft in order to get from one place to another very, very quickly. Now these SR-71s as we know them, the Blackbird, are the type of aircraft that are still classified in a sense as far as the altitude that it flies at and also the speed records that it holds. I'm very proud to say that this aircraft played a big part in helping to end the Cold War. The aircraft, the predecessor aircraft, there's strong evidence to suggest that perhaps these aircraft had a different role once in the air. Each pilot, and I knew a few of them, each pilot had an assignment before they took off. Okay? They learned about the assignment immediately prior to takeoff, and there's strong evidence to suggest that there was a dual role in that they were monitoring some type of traffic to and from planet Earth. This can be verified at a later point. This was, pro I'll jump into my military experience. My first field assignment for the United States Air Force was at Las Vegas Air Force Station. And that was my first experience with Las Vegas, and I couldn't understand why people were being so uh, excited about going to a place such as this, but I soon found out about a year later. Uh, Nellis Air Force Base is located there. Nellis is a major training center for different types of special aircraft and fighter aircraft, one of the premier training sites for pilots all around the world. However, when I learned that my assignment was at a radar site 50 miles out of town, up near Mount Charleston. Uh, I had no idea where, we'd, where I'd be, so finally in the daylight, I was able to find the location and report it in, uh, in 1965 for duty. In 1966, early in the morning, about 1 to 2 a.m., I was sleeping, I was staying there on base, and our barracks were at about 8,000 feet. I heard a lot of commotion. You know, at that altitude, sound carries. Sound carries tremendously. And I thought, well, it's early in the morning, it's summertime, and there is a lot, it's very warm, and maybe I should get up and take a look. I didn't really want to, but I got up and took a look, walked up to the main road up near my office, which was the commander's office. I was on the commander's staff. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Evans, and I couldn't, I, I was saying, who's making all this noise? Who's making all this noise at this time of the morning? So when I got within about 50 yards of the five, four or five people that were standing there, one being the chief of security, they were looking up in the air, and I said, gee, they all, their heads are all head, uh, looking at the same direction. Well, I looked up to the west, northwest, and to my amazement, there were lights flashing around the sky, moving at anywhere from what seemed like 2,400 to about 3,800 miles per hour. Now, the fact 
that we're taking an estimate from a distance, uh, you know, we figured, well, this is, this is quite something. However, we continue to watch these, fly, these darting lights go across the sky and stop, absolutely stop, come to a dead stop and reverse in an acute angle their direction and then proceed on in sort of, they were traveling so fast that you could almost see a pattern left by, if you are computer people, when you move a mouse real quick across the screen, you see a little bit of a tail. Well, that's exactly the way these six or seven craft worked. After five minutes of watching these things, they all seemed to group up to the west, northwest. Okay? They started to come in on a circle. But what I would like to point out is that where they were putting on their display in the north, northwest sky, just directly east of that is what is known as Area 51. Area 51 is a AEC name, okay? Atomic Energy Commission. That was the old name for Atomic Energy Commission. We knew it as the Groom Lake Flight Test Facility in the Air Force. And it was where we tested our aircraft at the, after we got the prototype made from the Skunk Works. So here are these, let's get back to the circle in the sky. What they did was coalesce and, and started rotating in a circle and then they disappeared. Well, I thought, gee, this is something that we have to keep quiet. And that was verified by the chief of security. But we waited there and talked it over for a little bit. And it seemed like, I think it was an hour. Then came the radar people from the scopes, which were at 10,000 plus feet, came down for their dinner at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the first person off the bus was a good friend of mine, Anthony Kesar. He said, he was white as a sheet, and he says, did you see that? Yeah, we all said, yeah, yeah, it was a nice display. What a show. He says, we documented them on radar. And he says, we didn't give them clearance. We just, the standing order was let them fly through the radar beam. He says, we documented six to seven UFOs. Now, we don't know who was guiding those, but they were certainly intelligent. And uh, we don't know where they landed because they coalesced and disappeared. So I will say at this point, to keep it short, that I will testify under oath as to what I say is true, and I will do so before Congress. Thank you. My name is Robert Solis. Uh, contrary to what it says on the card, I was not a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force uh, active duty after I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1964 until 1971 and separated as a captain. In uh, uh, March of 1967, I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana uh, as a missile launch officer, Minuteman missiles. Uh, on an on a early morning of uh, March 16th, 1967, I got a call from my security guard, primary security guard upstairs. Uh, we had about uh, six, as I recall, uh, flight security uh, airmen upstairs. I was downstairs 60 feet underground in a capsule uh, monitoring and uh, controlling 10 uh, nuclear-tipped Minuteman missiles. Uh, I got a call that morning uh, that they were seeing strange lights flying in the sky. Uh, I, I disregarded that call. I uh, told them to uh, call me when something more significant happened. Um, I got another call uh, subsequent to that call, and this time it was a more uh, intense tone in the, in the guard's uh, voice. It was very, clearly very frightened. Um, he said there was a... Uh, a bright glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval shaped. Um, he had all the other guards out there with their weapons drawn. Right after that call I woke up my commander who was on a rest period, uh, uh, Fred Mywald, a retired colonel now, uh, and uh, told him about the phone calls. As I was telling him about the phone calls my weapons started going down. Uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call a no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> we lost uh, somewhere between uh, six